Well, now to hear about how gold can play a key role in restoring sound money to our monetary system and much more, let's get right to this week's exclusive interview. It is my privilege now to welcome in Keith Weiner, CEO and founder of Monetary Metals and president of the Gold Standard Institute USA. Keith is a hard money advocate who has been an outspoken proponent for the gold standard and restoring sound money to our nation's monetary system. Keith has a PhD from the New Austrian School of Economics, and his articles have appeared in numerous publications on internet sites throughout the globe. And it's a real pleasure to have him on with us today. Keith, thanks so much for taking the time, and welcome. Hey, Mike, thanks for having me on. Well, Keith, uh, I think a good place to start would be to have you explain a little bit about your efforts to bring about the restoration of a gold standard. As, as a primer, give us some background on, on why you believe it's necessary in returning confidence in the dollar and what kind of change it would bring to our nation's finances, which, as we both agree, is, is quickly running off the rails. So, so how did you get to this point? Why are you so passionate about this cause? And ultimately, why is it needed? So I was your classic computer nerd, um, went off to computer science school, dropped out because I got bored, wanted to build a software company, which I did from 1994 to 2008, sold my software company, which was called Diamondware, to a little company called Nortel Networks. The, the transaction was August 19, 2008. That happened to be the last acquisition that Nortel ever did. They immediately, right after that, began spiraling out of control and into bankruptcy by January of 2009. And then I closed my transaction with a cash deal heading into the fall of 2008. At first, it seemed very surreal to me as I was sitting in 100% cash possession and some big, too big to fail banks, watching everything go on sale. But then as things continued to go on, I began to become more and more alarmed and realized that the standard explanations for this didn't make any sense. So I, I dove deeper and deeper into markets and economics just to understand how to protect myself. But the deeper I got in, the more I realized how serious the problem was. And it clicked for me that I wanted my next venture to be part of the solution. And it was obvious even before I started to study economics too much, it was obvious that the solution had something to do with gold. If it was a normal world, my next venture would have been another software company. But given the world as it is, I wanted I wanted to be part of the solution and that was that was gold. Now, as many listening may already know, we are fellow travelers, and with the Sound Money Defense League of Money Metals Public Policy Project, we've been working on removing the sales and capital gains taxes on gold and silver at the state level, among other things. You were uh, deeply involved in the success in Arizona, so you know it can be an uphill battle, but success is possible. One of our allies in, in this cause is Congressman Alex Mooney from West Virginia. Now, you recently wrote an open letter to Congressman Mooney about H.R. 5404, the bill he introduced, which would define the dollar as a fixed weight of gold. In that letter, you outlined why defining a dollar in terms of a fixed weight would be akin to price fixing and therefore dangerous. But you certainly support sound money. So is, is there a, a practical way to relink the dollar to gold? What would a workable gold standard look like, Keith, or would a different approach be better? So if you, if you look back to 1792, the first coinage act, the dollar was not linked to gold. The dollar was the definition of a certain weight of gold or silver. And so we've had a series of evolutions, or maybe arguably you can call them devolutions, in the century since 1792. The net result of which is that by 1971, Nixon infamously, and if you haven't seen, by the way, there's a YouTube of him uh, in his little speech in 1971, infamously severing the last link between the dollar and gold. So for the last 47 years, becoming up the 47th anniversary, is coming up in August next month. Uh, for 47 years, the dollar has been a pure, irredeemable paper product that has no relationship whatsoever to gold. To put this in perspective, what that means is when somebody borrows a dollar or somebody lends a dollar, there's no expectation that gold has anything to do with the transaction. How do you come along and retroactively declare actually it was a gold transaction? And so I think in my letter, I'm trying to remember what I said and what I didn't say uh, to Congressman Mooney. If you borrowed, let's say, $100,000 and the government comes along and retroactively says now the dollar is linked to gold, that means effectively you're repaying gold. So if the gold price was set low, let's say $100, that means it will take you 1,000 ounces of gold to get out of debt. You'll be working the rest of your life and, and your sons and their sons probably never get out of debt. 
On the other hand, if the gold price was $50,000, then it would only take two American gold eagles that you hand over to your creditor and you're out of debt. And so I think it'll be the biggest worthy of lobbying that Washington has ever seen with all the creditors, and this is counterintuitive, all the creditors wanting a very low price of gold, meaning that it would take lots and lots of ounces, uh, they would be paid lots and lots of ounces for their debtors to get out of debt, and all the debtors wanting a very high price of gold, which means it would take very few ounces to get out of debt. So I think I said to him, I applaud your intentions, I applaud where you're trying to go with this, obviously, but I don't think that's a practical mechanism for getting there. Yeah, certainly sounds pretty dangerous, uh, just like uh, just like you described. Now, now it seems pretty far fetched, frankly, to be talking about a return of some sort of gold standard. Yes, Congressman Mooney introduced a bill, but we doubt very many of his peers in the mainstream are anywhere near supporting this kind of measure. In, in what context do you think Congress might actually pass an honest money bill, Keith? I mean, is it is it going to take a total collapse in the dollar, or do you sense there is uh, the makings of a viable political movement here? All I can say to the total collapse and pray it never happens. If you look at 476 AD, it was pretty horrific. And the recovery took about 1,500 years before the world was back to the level that it achieved under Rome. You know, in U.S. history, there's been a number of cases where we've had a bad or an evil institution, and Americans, without necessarily having that crisis, had come to realize it was wrong and, and repealed it. Now, the first doesn't quite fit my criteria, being the end of slavery. Obviously, there was a war over that. But in, in more recent decades, you had the end of Prohibition, and you had the end of Jim Crow. And now we're having, I, I believe we're having, I think they're writing on the wall, the end of marijuana Prohibition. And also what's called right to try for terminally ill patients to get access to drugs that haven't been FDA approved yet. Now, in each of these cases, I think it was Cato Institute published a book called Bootleggers and Baptists. The analogy being the Baptists are the moralizers who provide cover for an evil institution. Let's take prohibition as being maybe a little bit less emotionally charged. And there was the whole temperance movement and the idea that if you drink and it was sinful and so forth. And then there were the bootleggers that profiteer off of it. And if alcohol was, is in a free market, it's a low-margin product like any agricultural commodity, it's like bottled water or, or bottled soda. There's not a lot of money to be made on it, but if you make it illegal, then suddenly alcohol becomes a very expensive commodity. And so, according to the Cato book, the bootleggers and Baptists have this unholy alliance working together to keep something illegal. And yet, something happened. And what I think happened was the American public finally came to the realization that this is wrong, that you can't just make alcohol illegal. It has all kinds of damaging consequences to doing that. The government doesn't have the right to do that. And when those questions start getting raised and people are coming on board with the idea that this needs to end, then it comes to an end. And, and that came to an end then, and then subsequent to that was Jim Crow, uh, and now it's marijuana, and I think generally the same drivers. And so could that happen with with money, I think it could, provided people come to that same realization that what we currently have is outrageous, it's, it's unfair, it's immoral, and when people come to that realization, it will change, and probably not a minute before. Expand on that. What's immoral about it? So when they pass a, a series of laws, we'll broadly call them the legal tender laws, we are forced to use their debt as if it were money. So think about that. What we call money is a dollar... It says Federal Reserve note on the dollar bill, bill being uh, an old word for credit, and note being the word for credit promissory note. We're using their debt as if it were money. Now, FDR did this in 1933 when he made gold illegal to possess, as in criminal, as in go to prison for possessing gold the way, you know, the way it is for cocaine today. When he made it illegal for people to possess gold, that forces people to treat the government bond as if that was a conservative risk-free asset. In fact, if you ask any regulated financial professional today, what's the risk-free asset? They'll say the government bond. And so it forces everybody to turn to the government and, and become a lender to government as if that was a risk-free proposition. And, of course, uh, I think it's probably pretty well known in, in your audience that the Federal Reserve, right on their website, says that their stated policy target 
is 2% debasement per annum. So you're forced to save in this, in this paper, and they have a monetary policy of stealing 2% uh, per year. And, and so I, I called it immoral because, first of all, you have no right to force people to use something. And secondly, if you do force them to use something, you have no further right to then try to rob them at 2% per year. Yeah, very good explanation there. And it kind of leads me into my next question. You you spoke about bonds, and I wanted to ask you about one of the benefits of gold, in your view, is the idea of gold bonds. Uh, please explain this concept for folks who may not be familiar and, and tell us why you believe that states and individuals both should start adopting the issuance of gold bonds. So bonds and the pain of interest on gold is, I think, sort of the broader answer to uh, everything we've been talking about today so far. My response to Congressman Mooney would be, if you want gold to begin circulating, you have to issue a gold bond. You have to pay interest on gold. Interest is the one thing that will pull gold out of private hoards and into circulation. People have been hoarding gold for at least 5,000 years. They've been hiding it from their governments and from their neighbors. I had an interesting experience a couple of years ago giving this talk about gold hoard, and nobody talks about how much gold they have. And so I was at a club called the Phoenix Roadrunners. They're a group of gold prospectors who literally go up to them, their hills, looking for gold. I know they find some because at the start of the meeting, they gave away three nuggets, one to somebody who contributed to the newsletter, one to somebody who was really helpful with some new members, and one to, to a third person or something or other. And then it was my turn to talk. And so I said, okay, raise your hand if you have some gold, any amount of gold, raise your hand. You know, Mike, not a single hand went up, and there was, I think, 250, 300 people in the room, including the three people who just got handed gold nuggets. <laughs> not a single hand goes up. And so I said, hey, you know, thanks for proving my point that people have been hiding this from the, from everybody for, for thousands of years. Traditionally, this was the sort of thing that fathers didn't even tell their kids until on their deathbed they would summon the oldest son and say, son, we have 10 ounces of gold that's under the kitchen floorboards, under the stove, or whatever they would do because it was so dangerous. I mean, the government could take it, the government could declare you to be a criminal or a traitor, your neighbors could come and steal it or, or slit your throat in the middle of the night. It was just the sort of thing nobody wanted to talk about, nobody wants to acknowledge you know, having, and the thing that will pull it out is interest. If you say to somebody, lend me your gold, I'll pay you zero, then the answer is I don't have any gold. If you talk to somebody and say, lend me your gold, I'll pay you 5%, well, there was a a semi-famous incident involving J.P. Morgan around one of the banking panics. I, I believe it was 1907, if I haven't found the documentation for this. And somebody comes up to him and says, Mr. Morgan, Mr. Morgan, there's a crisis in New York. There's a shortage of gold. What are we going to do? And so he said, raise the interest rate. 4%, he said, will draw it off the continent. And you think about in those days, steamships and the cost and risk and time to get gold from Europe to New York. Then 5%, he said, will pull it down off the moon. And so what he was doing was, first of all, illustrating the principle that interest draws gold into the market, and secondly, bracketing it and saying 4% is hyperbole, 5% is fantasy. So in a talk I gave recently, and I put this in one of my papers, I saw a picture of a gold bond hanging on the walls of the Harvard Club in New York. This was a railroad bond issued in 1905. It had a 92-year maturity, and it paid 3.5% interest, obviously gold. And so interest is the, is the thing that, that makes the gold flow. Now, for a state government, such as Nevada, and I've been in a lot of discussions with the Nevada government about this, there's a completely different proposition and a very practical one, actually two. Number one is the state. So the state has a lot of gold mining going on in Nevada. It's the number one state for gold mining in the U.S. They produce about 160 tons of gold here every year. So the state gets a, I believe it's 5% royalty or tax on that gold production. So the state has a gold income, and that's really the key to the whole thing. Now, the state, of course, sells the gold or has the miners sell the gold. And so the state has uh, the dollar proceeds from the sales of the gold, which means that the, st and the state obviously is servicing conventional dollar bonds with this gold income, which means the state has a mismatch. It has a gold income servicing a dollar bond or dollar liability, which means if the price of gold ever goes down, the state suddenly has a, 
unexpected budget shortfall, budget deficit. So, so the first proposition to refinancing its paper bonds with gold bonds is it'll eliminate the, the risk of this, of this deficit, eliminate the gold price risk that it is currently uh, incurring. But the second thing I think is the more interesting one, and that is the gold bond uh, provides a mechanism to get out of debt. And that mechanism is when the state auctions off the gold bond, my proposal is don't sell it for dollars. You're not trying to raise dollars. If you want to raise dollars, sell regular bonds. And don't sell it for gold. You're not trying to raise gold. Gold itself is not really a, a use to you if you're the state of Nevada. Tell the bit, tell the buyers that they have to bid in existing Nevada dollar bonds. That is, they have to tender, go to the market and buy some Nevada paper and then tender that, redeem that ultimately for the gold bond in exchange. So it's a mechanism to redeem one form of debt, uh, which is dollars, which is irredeemable debt normally, and exchange that for the new gold bond, which the state can amortize because it has a gold income, the mining tax that we just talked about. Now, what this does is it sets up a, an exchange ratio between paper bonds and gold bonds. So let me, let me put some numbers to this and make this pretty straightforward. So today the gold price is around 12.50 an ounce. And let's say the state were to sell a 1,000 ounce gold bond. So that means that that bond, 1,000 ounces, is worth $1.25 million. So what you'd expect to happen in the first auction is that buyers say, okay, you're giving us one, you know, $1.25 million worth of gold. We will buy and, and bring to you $1.25 million worth of outstanding paper bonds to exchange for the gold bond. However, we're not talking about gold delivered today. This is a bond. We're talking about gold or dollars payable in 10 or 20 or 30 years. So now you start to think the dollar is being debased at 2% per year. That's the Fed's target, and of course they can overshoot. What is that dollar going to be worth in 10 or 20 or 30 years versus what is the gold going to be worth? And so what I expect will happen is the market will then offer more than $1.25 million worth of outstanding Nevada bonds in exchange for a 1,000-ounce gold bond. That is, the market will retire existing Nevada state debt at a discount in order to get the gold bond. And so that mechanism of retiring the debt at a discount is a huge benefit to the state. If the state ends up retiring its debt at a 20% discount, that's a, a huge benefit the state couldn't get any other way. Yeah, it's very fascinating. Hopefully something that will actually gain more traction. There's uh, some tremendous advantages in all that, as you just explained. Well, as we begin to wrap up here, Keith, uh, give us your take on the markets today about whether or not you think we have honest price discovery and, and where we go from here in the metals. The, the broader sense, no, we don't have honest price discovery because the government teach us their propaganda from the age of two that gold is just a volatile commodity and the dollar is money. But in the narrower sense, I think anybody who wants to buy physical gold or gold futures can do so, and I think there's a market that provides uh, the clearing price for that at any given moment. Well, I certainly want to thank you for your time. It was a very enjoyable conversation, and we definitely support your efforts in pursuing and getting more traction to see sound money restored to our nation's monetary system, and, and more and more people hopefully will look at gold and silver as a solution to the global financial problems. So keep up the good work, and, and I hope we can speak with you again and follow this as it continues to develop. Uh, take care, Keith. All right, thanks. I look forward to it, Mike.